Hello from the History of Diving Museum, located in the beautiful Florida Keys at mile marker 83. We are very happy to have a room full of our members and um, people that are in town. So welcome, welcome. We welcome to those who are watching on our Zoom, as well as those who will be watching later on, because this will be recorded and uploaded to our YouTube channel. So, um, the History of Diving Museum puts on an Immerse Yourself program on the third Wednesday of every night at seven o'clock, again, on Zoom and in person when we can. We wanna thank our sponsor tonight, who is an HDM History of Diving Museum member, retired Admiral Kurt Tidd. He usually likes to do October because it's the anniversary of the Navy. So happy 248th anniversary to the Navy. He wanted to be here tonight. He lives in the Florida Keys, but he is up in Washington, D.C. at a board meeting for the Olmsted Foundation, which helps to um, cultivate Navy leaders and um, helps them in their career path. So we appreciate the fact that he can't be here tonight, but he is with us on Zoom. So thank you very much, um, Admiral Kurt Tidd. We have the Aquanauts to Astronauts exhibit that will be open through December 31st. Halloween event coming up next week, treasure treats. So come out in costume. We're gonna have haunted exhibits, spooky exhibits. We're gonna have people, uh, staff members in costume, handing out candy and so forth and a costume contest. And then for those of you that are in the Keys on November 11th, we'll be helping Dick Workowski uh, celebrate his 93rd birthday and semi-retirement. Um, up at the uh, Elks Lodge in Tavernier. If you're interested, uh, give us a call or um, check out our website, divingmuseum.org. Next month's Immerse Yourself is going to be the Battleship of Ice, something I had never heard of, so I'm looking forward to this presentation. It's with Professor Susan Langley, and tonight we have what I consider a marine legend, Jan Koblik. He's an ocean explorer. He's had um, over 50 years um, on the water as an aquanaut. He's an author. He's done numerous expeditions. And uh, as we say, diving before there were rules. And it's always an adventure on the water. <laughs> so um, we do have some of his books, their recent books, um, in the museum store, if anybody's interested. So thank you very much for coming down. Thank you for being a member. Thank you for bringing your family. And uh, look forward to your presentation. Yeah, well, I'm going to have to, and they need some help getting that started. Um, we'll try. We'll leave it right there for now. Okay. Okay, so as an introduction, I just wanted to say that now, this is not a sales pitch for the book. I wanted to explain something to you. That of the seven habitats that have existed in the last 50 years in the United States, I have either built the sites for them, built the habitats, run the programs, or been an aquanaut in four out of the seven. So the Tech Tai 1, Tech Tai 2, La Chalupa, Marine Lab, uh, and I didn't even count jewels because that's not an offshore habitat. But anyway, the Caribbean and ran all those programs. But then uh, in the 1970s, 1977, funds ran out for support of the ocean, brought my family to the States and started working on education. We needed more people to be involved in marine conservation. And I started in Fort Lauderdale. And I went out to the boat brokers and I said, hey, get us, get us some boat donations so I can build a little bus looking like some, a submarine looking like bus, bus looking like submarine, and take it around to the schools and tell them about climate change and all the things that we're seeing now. And in doing so, oh, okay, I knew it. How do I do this? Let's go over here. Those little arrows down there. There we go. There we go. So one day I received a phone call from a boat broker that said, hey, Dylan, I've got a guy that has his big boat and he wants to go uh, treasure hunting and he, and he wants sort of a onboard consulting scientist. What do you think? My bag's packed. Uh, so, so I go to... Uh, this was in uh, Palm Beach, 
And this is not a grubby old uh, diesel boat, you know, that smells of diesel. It's a 146 foot ocean going salvage tug. And I, I have a meeting with Ed Burnt, who's the owner of this boat. And he says, well, I'd love you to join me and go on this, this trip. We're going to go down to the Serenia Banks. And it's a, a famous bank, very low, that had a lot of shipwrecks on it. So I pack my bag and go up there and meet the boat, and off we go. So we get to the Serenia Bank, and it says on the chart, and I really tried to find a chart tonight to put in the, the, the show here, but it says, U.S. Columbia. So we pull in and there's about a 200 foot battleship in there with a great big cannon and they come over and they inspect us. And here we are coming into uh, the Serenia Banks. And the next thing you know, I have the, uh, the Colombian Navy on board. This is a uh, Capitan de Fregata from the, from the, sh the battleship that was there. And they arrested the boat. And they literally, but if you look here, they put 14 marineros on board the boat and uh, told us that we had to go to San Andreas Island, some 200 miles away. Well, the ship was, uh, <coughs> was uh, registered uh, Cayman Islands. And so uh, Cayman Islands were about 200 miles to the north, and Andreas was 200 miles to the south. So we said, this isn't working. We got on the radio in those days, they didn't have GPS or anything else, but they had a huge ship's radio on here. And I called my wife and said, we've got a problem. And we started working all the angles. I had congressmen that were friends and lawyers that were on the phone. And my partner who lives here, Dr. Neil Money, was the uh, head of uh, ocean engineering at the US Naval Academy. So I called him, and after three days of making these phone calls, we made a plan to capture the ship and make a run for the Cayman Islands. And so how are we going to capture the ship? Well, we had three plans. One is that I told the, the Capitan de Fregata that, you know, your guys are hot and they're tired, they're in the sun, they have no plan. Oh, they started wandering around the boat. I said, no, no, you can't do that because then you're liable. So we made them all stay in the back. So I said, we can give them all the shower, but they'll have to all you know, stack their guns over here and get naked and run through the shower because we don't have a lot of water. So that was plan one. And he said, OK. Plan two was in the, in the uh, owner's cabin, Ed Burns cabin, in the back of the cabin, we'd taken guns from a lot of the crew. So we had a whole cabin full of guns, all different, you know, everything from 22s to shotguns to whatever. And so it, it, we were going to take these guys prisoner. And we were going to do that by, uh, I sent the cook down to get everything out of the uh, the, the drug locker, you know, the, and anything that you could, would cause diarrhea or throwing up, I want you to get ready to put that in the food. So here we are prepared to, to make this move. And they tell us that we have to go to San Andreas Island the next day. And I talked to my, my buddy, Neil, who has picked up the phone and called the the Admiral of the Colombian Navy, and said, these are my friends. I'm on the board of directors of this guy's foundation. They're not doing anything wrong. And the Admiral, the Santos was his name, said, have them go to San Andreas Island, and if they don't find anything wrong on the boat, they'll be gone in 24 hours. And I checked with two other people who were checking. It. So we decided to go to San Andreas. Well, here we are pulling in at San Andreas. I'd like you to look at all the armed guys with their guns. And the ship behind me, I'm so sorry. The ship behind us, the one you see there in the foreground, uh, was a fishing boat that they captured. Mm -hmm. And moments before I took this picture, the, the truck came up, threw them all in this truck, and hauled them off. So we mm -hmm. thought we're in we're in big trouble. Um, but and, and the story of how we escaped all this is kind of fun. Uh, basically, we were called into the port captain's office the next day. And we, as we get in, we have a, an agent. You know, a ship has to have a ship's agent to get your supplies. And the ship's agent says, great, big fellow. And he, and he sits down 
And we're sitting there and he said, you know, the, the commandant and I are in opposite political parties. And the last time I saw him, we got in a fight. I thought, we're dead. We're, we're never going to leave this island. But uh, after a couple of hours of his questioning us, uh, Ed Berg said, the, the, the uh, Admiral said we'd be out of here in 24 hours. And with that, we were released. Well, we got back to Palm Beach. <clears throat> Ed Berg said, I'm done with the Golden Venture. Do you want it? <laughs> and I said, yes. He said, I'll donate it to your foundation, Marine Resource Development Foundation. So here's the boat that I inherited. And in, uh, this, this, this first trip was 1978. So we got this boat in 1980, 1989, 79. And so this we're going to use the boat now for salvage. I want you to take a look at this. Is you all know what a mailbox is? If you look at the size of the piece, that's me over there on the right, and one of my engineer. This thing was nine feet in diameter, and it dumped a hole forty feet wide, twenty feet deep, in twenty minutes. And then we'd go down and dive it. And I, I'll show you that this boat made. Calypso looked like a piece of junk. Here's the here's the uh, the uh, the blower the, the going down, and here we are making a hole. You can see that it had a four point more. Those are the lines going out, and the stern, and then the bow lines. Uh, and every, so we we would blow a hole in 20 minutes, dive it with a metal detector for 20 minutes, and then we would move the boat about 20 feet. So actually what we left behind is it looked like somebody had been welding in the sand. It was just a little ridge every 20 feet. We'd fill in behind us. But you can see, we had, I had 18 crew and this is our, our tank filling area. Here's Tonya, my wife of going on 62 years, um, hanging onto the submarine I had on board. Uh, these are the divers getting ready to go down and plunge in a hole as soon as the, uh, the, the uh, prop stopped turning. And here we are bringing up gold bars. I'm playing around, punching on a, punching on a gold bar. This is Torrid. This is Torrid. <laughs> With gold, Torrid was 14 years old. He brought up more gold bars individually than all of the Mel Fisher divers. <laughs> they hated him. And here are some of the things that you'll see in the museum. We brought this up, this little gold parrot with the emerald. We brought up 14 buttons off the shirts of the, uh, the clerk. An idea of how thorough our, our search were to, to be able to get over. This was over, you know, uh, several, several blows. Gold chains, we brought up a number of gold chains. Here's the, the, the most valuable artifact ever recovered is this emerald cross, which is in the museum. And the black back there is a line laying on the deck of the ship. And these are all of the gold bars that we brought up, the emerald ring, the chain, all laying on the, on the ship's deck. And this is just another picture. The, um, the Emerald Cross, I brought up on my birthday myself. Why? Because we were having a birthday party for me and they were still a diver in the water. And he was diving with his partner was a girl, um, Katie. And so she came up and I said, where's uh, Rico? He said, oh, he's still down there. So I said, I wanna get this party going. Put my fins on and dive down, went down and he was digging away, but he couldn't get whatever the hit was out of the, the thing. So I took off my fin and I, I drove it into the side of the pit and cleaned out under it and out came that, what you see up there is the that little silver box about the size, a little bigger than a sardine can. So I took the silver box because we didn't leave anything. We cleaned up all the trash, everything we brought out. And I went over to the ladder and as I lifted up to go up, I heard clunk and I said, Petrified sardines, I don't think so. 
So before the party started, we opened this box, which was against all the rules. But I said, I'm the captain, it's my ship, it's my birthday, open the box to the treasure master. So he opened the box and out of the, the, uh, the, the water was black from silver oxide, poured the water out and there was this cross and that emerald ring. And I heard in the back of the crowd, I love emeralds from my brother. <laughs> but anyway, that was kind of an exciting day. And there's the emerald ring which, by the way, fit me perfectly. I wore it for oh, about a week. And every day I'd call Mel Fisher and say, Mel, come on out to the boat. you got to see this. I didn't want to say what it was because we actually had some night visitors that we had to run off one time. And we, we had a, a radio system that worked on uh, call and, and, and respond on two different frequencies. So it was harder to monitor. But I kept saying, you need to come out. He said, no, I'll send it in. No, come out. No, send it in. Mel, you need to come out. So uh, here's here's Tonya looking at, and that's Torin on the right, and my other son here next to my wife, and looking at the uh, Emerald Cross in the uh, in the little box. And here's the, the crew, uh, and that's my older son in the middle, and everybody's holding something. Of gold, there's those are gold coins, silver bars. Uh, how many of you met Thane Milhone when he was here working? Did any of you? Yeah, that's Thane's father in the background. So here's what we brought up. So like they used to do in, in the World War II, you know, put the uh, the uh, the number of kills that they had. <laughs> we kept track of it all on the bow of the boat there. Now. Here's Mel Fisher, came out there, notice he's got the cigarette in one hand and his cigarettes in his, in his panel. He was always with a cigarette, but he brought out a huge magnum of champagne and he celebrated the end of the cross. But I had a couple of other folks on board too. And this was a congressman. Party National Convention, he built the Alaska pipeline. So they were influential people that were out and were with us. And a few weeks later, I got a phone call from Bill Alexander that said, hey, I'm going to Cuba. You think you'd like to go? So I I hesitated. This, this is the first time I've ever publicly done this because for many, many years, it was forbidden to be involved with Cuba. But I went to Cuba. <laughs> And I, there's Fidel Castro. See the T-shirt he's wearing? <laughs> so I spent three days spearfishing with Fidel. And uh, here he is coming down to get on the boat to go diving. And then uh, here we are getting ready to go. We were uh, free diving uh, just, uh, and spearfishing. And here spearfishing with a spear gun. And he would pass the spear gun around. We uh, filled the boat. He had a little boat floating with an old man rowing, and he had three UDT divers, the, the Cuban UDTs, that, that loaded the spear guns and handed them to him. So there was always a loaded spear gun down there. And he'd shoot one and then get another spear gun, give it to me. I'd shoot one. And at the end of the day, we had a whole dock. And a little guy in the boat would come and get the fish and put it in the boat. End of the day, they were all in the dock. He brings out his uh, his chef and says, I'd like this lobster here, Thermidor, and this fish, you know, and he went through this whole thing, and then we'd have these dinners that would start, as you saw, drinking whiskey, and they'd start around seven in the evening, and they'd end at three or four in the morning. And this went on for, whoops, several days. <laughs> now, I have to tell you that uh, this is a dive boat. Okay, we're on a Cuban dive boat, and the dive operators here need to learn a lesson here, because here we're having lobster on the way back, and there's beer and rum on the way back, so we have a long ways to go here in our operations. <laughs> okay, so then, this is the next day, my wife and I were planning a trip around the world. We we're on our way to New Zealand, as a matter of fact. And I was not home. I was already three days late, four days late. 
and and she said, you know, the plane leaves tomorrow at two o'clock, and and our group wasn't leaving the island until late that evening. So I talked to the president, and I said, you know, I really need to get back to uh, Havana, and he said, well, I'm flying to a meeting tomorrow, so come with me. So we got in the helicopter, flew off. And there was a storm, so they landed at the Bay of Pigs. And then he had three Mercedes and a, tran and a translator. So we got in the car. I'm sitting by, on the left, on the right. And, and at my feet is an AK-47. Uh, and he's, he's wearing a pistol and smoking. And, and I had given him my book on living and working in the sea. And <clears throat> so... He, I was trying to read something, but I needed glasses. So I reached over and took his glasses out of his little jacket. I'm reading with his glasses, and then he puts the glasses on. And we had this great conversation, got to Havana. He said, here, take my car and get to the airport. So he gets out, gives me the car and the driver, take me to the airport. And I get there, and I'm standing in line, this big, long line, all the Cubans lined up. Nothing's moving. So finally, and I look out there, we have a private plane with a a naval officer who's part of the group going back. So I'm riding in this private plane. So I go marching right up to the front desk in my very best Spanish, with like three words at the time. I said, El President, he wouldn't want me to have his caro if he didn't want me to get on that aeroplano, you know? <laughs> I was out. So, all right, so that was my, my treasure hunting here in Florida and uh, and I thought that the, the lead up to the going with the seat, uh, Castro was kind of interesting. So I included that in treasure. But here in 2005, uh, we formed Aurora Trust, my partner, uh, uh, Craig Mullen. And uh, it was funded by a group out of Washington. And we, we, uh, we, in, I called it in the footsteps of Cousteau. And so here's the Calypso. Uh, but uh, unlike Cousteau, we had preferred our uh, support ship with a few of the comforts of home. Here's our support ship. So, so you can imagine that we had a lot of uh, guests on board. Uh, and we, we uh, this is the little boat that we had here. John, you saw it, right? You, you saw this boat, didn't you? Yeah. I didn't see it. Oh, oh, wow. I had it here for a while. I like to see it, yeah. And it was equipped. We, the cable back there uh, gave us uh, 3,000 feet of capability with our uh, ROV. Uh, and here's our ROV. Here's a little cabin. And our equipment was all state of the art. So we came to the different countries. Uh, we worked in uh, Italy. Sicily, Malta, uh, Malta was our home base. <coughs> Next to, uh, what's the name of the ship? Uh, Hercule. Her no, and you're, Princess Duda. Oh, Princess Duda, yeah. And, and, Her and Hercules happens to be RPM, which is in Key West. So here was Key West, Key Largo, and uh, all in the same harbor. And uh, we, we set up programs to go to these different countries. We worked with their archaeologists and their uh, marine antiquities uh, ministers to think of the paths that ancient ships might have taken. And then we'd go out with our side scan and uh, multi-beam and we record it. So we had with uh, Spain, Italy, Sicily, Malta, Croatia, uh, France, uh, we operated in those countries. And, and so these are the kind of people that, that we worked with. And so we had no problems getting permits. Uh, the superintendent uh, of Italy, uh, <clears throat> we got a phone call from uh, Paul Allen's captain, said, uh, Paul Allen and, and his, his wives are tired of shopping in Capri. They really like to go down and see some of those ships that you found, but they applied. And they said it'll be four to six months, you know, to get the permit. Can you help us? So we called up Anna Maria and said, Anna Maria, you want to go for a submarine ride? 
Two days later, Paul Allen was down in his submarine. That was a luxury submarine with a little bathroom with a with a uh, granite sink. I mean, it was a pretty fancy submarine. And then uh, the superintendent of the seas of Sicily, Sebastiano uh, Tuzza, was an incredible, well, you can imagine if you're in Sicily and you're the superintendent of the seas, who do you think he works for? Everything that you wanted to have done was done immediately. There was no question. And uh, he was one of the fellows killed in that 737 crash in Ethiopia. The new said never he was killed in that. So anyway, here's the president of Malta. Uh, and he was at our house for dinner one night. So you can, we did a lot of work on this island. And I'm going to try to show you a short clip, if it works, on Ben Tatani. This was an island that was developed by Caesar, and he, and he put his daughter on it to keep her away from sleeping with the enemy back in Rome. Um, and so this is what we did in each of the islands that we go to. We'd spend weeks mapping and, with the site scan. And any time that we had a little uh, something of interest, we'd go back, like you'd see something like this, on the plat and we go, well, we don't know what that is. So then we'd go down and zoom in on it with our, you know, get a little lower. And this looked like a shipwreck of tires, you know, when you looked at that. But uh, you know, all this video has a little music, but this island, I want you to look at, it's all limestone and they carved this, the Roman carved this entire marina out of the limestone. See the ballard on the left? carved out of limestone, and it's still intact and still used as a marina. Here we are getting ready to go out. ISIS, we changed the name of that boat about the time that things started happening in Europe. And um, the, these are our safety divers, the Carabinetti, which are the federal police of Italy. So we had 14 safety divers that would accompany us around the island at night uh, to go to dinner. And the locals thought that we were either really, really bad guys with 14 guards, or we were really important guys. Little did they know we were all just diving together. <laughs> so now we send a boat out and we send the ROV down and the divers are, are using uh, rebreathers. What year is this? About? It's 2010. <laughs> What depth? Uh, 130 meters, I believe. About 400 and about 380 feet. Wow. So here's here goes that we have two divers going down, and then we follow them with the ROV. So you'll be able to see them and us and the ROV. Uh, the water was crystal clear. We happened to anchor right over the wreck. So here's the shipwreck full of lobster. Wow. And this is the border wreck. The more, see all the lined up as they were 2,000 years ago. Hundreds of them, probably thousands. Now, now what are they? What are these? These are uh, like, you know, we have little mortar and pestles. Uh -huh. This was a Roman mortar, and they had a pestle which they would grind up the grain with oh, in order yeah. to make bread. Yeah. Now, this is a different wreck. You see that the uh, amphora on this one are small necked. So these were either olive oil or wine. And I don't think that I have a, uh, a third a third wreck here, but we found 28 wrecks intact like that in our diving. And here we are. So we had all these these super fragile ideas for bringing these things up. You know, we were gonna put them in a little sack and uh, these guys went over, hooked the chain on it, pulled it up. Oh, they were solid as a rock. But you can see there were thousands of the uh, M4 down there. Mm -hmm. Julie will be right there to help. <laughs> Do you wanna let it play and then go back to the other presentation? Yeah, we can, we can, that's, I just want them to see that the kind of uh, boats we can, we can go on to the next one. So that's what they look like when we brought them out of the water. 
And here are some different uh, shipwrecks. But you can see that the Amphora are still lying as they were 2,000 years ago. And uh, in Malta, I, I'm going to go through we, all the different countries where we were. I'm just going to show you quickly what we surveyed and basically what was there. So in Malta, I did a special program. Uh, the cisterns were ancient cisterns, and nobody really knew where they went or, or if they were attached. So we got a little tiny ROV and, and we put it in there, just as you see, just barely fit and ran it around and we mapped all the systems, or the ones that we did, we mapped them. Uh, the one here on the left is different than the one on the right. And they were different, but they turned out that they came from the same water source. One of the things I was looking for was where during raids and things, they might have thrown coins down there or swords or something, but we found nothing. Uh, here is in the Malta, this is an Italian torpedo boat. You can see the torpedoes are still on board. Can you make that out? Can you see them? No? Those are the torpedoes. And then uh, here's the machine gun on deck. And here's all the ammunition laying on deck. And then uh, here's a, a World War II airplane. We found a look at This is really neat. This is the Olympus in a British submarine that was leaving the port of Malta, uh, Valletta, at night. And it had 90 sailors on board. The normal submarine crew was 45. They had another 40-something sailors who were from submarines that had already been destroyed or sunk, and they'd survived. And as they were coming out, they hit a mine, a German mine, and blew a hole. I, I have a video here. Uh, of, I think I'm going to try to do this one. Uh -huh. So the, here's a video of the submarine sitting there intact, great big hole in the battle, and the hatches are open. So many of the sailors escaped and were carried away by the currents. Of course, it was total black blackout on Malta. They had no idea where they were, and only nine of them survived. They were picked up the next day. So no one knew where this submarine was. We found it and uh, videoed the whole thing. You can see here the bow coming up. And it's all intact except for a hole up here in the bow. And now there have been divers on it since. I don't know, you, you knew about this wreck? Yeah. Yeah, they found it right after we found it. Well. They dove it right after we dove the L-72 in Malta. How deep is that one? About 300 feet, 100 meters. They never found it. So in addition to the archaeology, Aurora Trust, I told you this whole thing is about education. So we were trying to get young people involved in not just biology in the ocean, but the cultural aspects of what they found. And so we did lectures to classes, and we built a... Uh, oh, dear. But that's all right here. We this is a uh, little little worksheets that we put together, and we did them in uh, French, Maltese, English, and Arabic. And we worked in uh, uh, Lebanon, is another country where we spent quite a bit of time working. So here we were trying to get kids to start thinking about their cultural heritage. Where did you know where did all this come from, and where did it go? Cartagena. Cartagena is a naval base in Cartagena, Spain. And it's been a naval base for, I don't know, since the 15 or 1400s or something. And of course, it was a Roman port where they exported huge amounts of silver. And uh, so we were right there. And this is the mapping that we did in Cartagena. And here's some of the stuff that we found. We found anchors, we found this wreck, which was the largest Roman shipwreck ever found. It made international news and the Minister of Antiquities came out to make a big announcement. It had a, over 5,000 amphora. Uh, now these are, these are see how big the neck is on these amphora? These are called garum amphora. You know what garum is? 
It's something that you don't want to eat. I mean, you just had it last week. You did? <laughs> it's, it's fermented fish with salt. And it's sort of like the Vietnamese uh, fish sauce, but worse. <laughs> <laughs> but it was very, very expensive. And, and these had the wide mouth like this. And this, so this was a garb ship. And, and if any of you are interested, we did a movie. It was on PBS and it was on uh, National Geographic. It's called Lost Ships of Rome. It's about a 50 minute movie. And it, it'll show some of what I just showed you about Ventitani, but it also showed us making garb. And then we had all those carabinieri on board and we made them taste it. And you can see the expressions of the people that taste it. <laughs> so these are the, more of the garum jars. And we found shipwrecks. The, the interesting thing was that since this had been a port for all those hundreds and hundreds of years, that this uh, Roman shipwreck was totally intact. It hadn't had anchors dug over it or anything. It was an eight. So now it's a, it's a historical site and it's off, off bounds for anchorage. This is... And Syracusa was in 412 BC. The uh, the uh, the Greeks felt that the Syracusans were uh, coming too, too close to being competitive with them in the shipping and trade. So they uh, sent down a, a navy of 40,000, I think it was, and uh, 100 ships. I, I, I'm having trouble with those numbers, but inside that bay that you see there, they, uh, the second year, there was a huge battle and the, the uh, Greeks couldn't get out because the Syracusans put ships across the harbor entrance so they couldn't get out. So we went in there, there were hundreds of uh, Marines with their big shields and their, uh, their lances and all that that were, that were drowned and the ships were broken apart. We went down there to try to recover them after we did our survey work. But what we found out is that our multi our site scan uh, was really picking up World War II debris. It was about nine feet under silt, and the the, the uh, bay had silted in about thirty or forty feet over the last two thousand years. So, so much for finding Romans. Um, but, but we had quite a, uh, a, a joint venture in Sicily with all these different agencies. And here we are tied up in uh, Syracuse with our ship, the, gold, the uh, Fortaleza and the little survey boat. And, uh, and that's the area that we surveyed. And this is what we were looking for. The, the, the prows of the boats with the big copper prows for ramming and then the Marines and the shields so forth. Well, here's so Capri, we found uh, some shipwrecks. Um, and then this was really interesting because for some reason, we didn't recover any of these bars, which are either lead or silver. And I'm betting that they're silver. And we found uh, dozens of them in the one wreck. Here's the crew. And that's the story of Aurora and our exploration. Nothing like what Eric is doing in uh, Egypt, but it was still pretty exciting. So how many of you are divers? How many are tech divers? Okay, well, if, if you'll bear with me for five minutes, I'd like to show you my little thing on before there were rules. I, I think you <laughs> yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So this is Lambrisher Bay in uh, the Virgin Islands where the Tectide project was. And I I built the base camp there. That, that's all covered in, in that book I was telling you about all how all that happened. But I also was the the, the the test pilot for the first rebreathers to come out, the Stark Electrolung, the GE Biomarine, and the GE, and I'm sorry, the, the Biomarine units with Freddie Parker and, and then the uh, GE units. 
And we use the GE uh, rebreathers in Tech Type 1, the first zero mode. And then I bought two uh, after that, two of them. And so here we are. I also had a lobster study grant from the NSF. So I wanted to go out on the edge of the 200 foot shelf and look around and see if those lobsters that we had tagged moved offshore or whether they stayed inshore. So I built a PTC, commonly referred to by the Perry uh, submarine builders as the KSC, the Koblik Submersible Coffin. Oh. <laughs> and you can see the size of this capsule and you see the guy, size of the guy I'm here. And there were two of us that would get into here with our rebreathers and go out. You can see swimming it out to the boat. I got a local fisherman to modify his boat with an A-frame. And here we are pulling it up, getting it on board. We go on out to sea, drop it in the water. Is it a safety diver? We're probably in about 150 feet of water here or something. Safety diver helping us. But here we are with our green breathers, getting ready to go uh, down and search for lobsters. And we we go around, we'd stay down there for, oh, maybe 40 minutes to an hour or so, um, and then come back to the, uh, to the uh, bell, crawl up in the bell, close the bottom. And there was a little magic marker on the side, which we'd, we'd put on, uh, calculating what our weight was and how much water we had to get out of this for it to lift to the surface on its own and how much pressure you had to keep. So you know that if you're full of water, it doesn't take but a little bit of a squeak in the valve to build you up to 400 PSI in there. And you had to really be careful that we, we stayed at 100 PSI if we were diving at 200 feet and that we blew the water down and this thing would go to the surface. Uh, here we are getting in. They put it back on the boat. With you inside? With us inside. Oh, then they put it back in the water. Then they take it and put it on this boat trailer and roll us up to the decompression chamber that I bought. <laughs> and we're inside and then equalize the pressure and decompress. So, oh, wow. Try that today. <laughs> anyway, I thought that you, I know it had nothing to do with treasure diving. And for the divers, you might be interested. Are those ones over at Marine Lab sitting out there with the tanks on it? Those are, those are about a third again bigger. A little bigger? Oh, yeah. Oh, hell no. And they're only, they're only this wow. big. So this thing was only like that. I mean, I don't know if you saw it. Wow. What year was that? What year? That this is uh, 1970, uh, 1970, 71. But wow. you see how big these guys are, and you see how big that chamber is. It's tiny. Yeah. There's two of you in there. Twister chamber. With yeah. Yes. Did any of you know Bob Stevens from Cottonell Shelf? That goes back a long way. He's been gone a long time. He was the guy, and he was a big guy. We're in there, we're all snuggled. I said, geez, Bob, move your armpit. He said, that's not my armpit. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, that's 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 all I had to say. So <laughs> are there any questions that you might have? No? Uh, John, I, that, that uh, first uh, pictures you were showing us on the uh, wreck when your son was 14 years old. Yeah. And what wreck was that at? And and that's the Atocha. No, that was on the yeah. Yeah. So if anyone asks a question, John, you could just repeat that question so okay. everyone else can get it. it. The question was, what wreck was I showing in the first slide? And that was the Atocha. It, it looked like when you brought the Golden Venture down, was that in Key West? Because I think in the background there was the Western Union, which was this, the, the schooner, the old, the last yeah. schooner built. In yeah. Yes, I had a deal with the Navy. I stayed at the Navy shipyard, which is now, you know, the Truman Annex. Right. Uh, and we had the ship there. And then it was right out in front of, what's the evening uh, show on the- Flower Square. Yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah. So we, in fact, 
Jimmy Buffett had really just opened his place, Margarita Bell, over there by the Churl Crawls. And although Jimmy Buffett didn't compose a song, there were songs about the boys of the Golden Venture because we were bringing up lots of treasure, lots. So did Bill Fisher contract you to work with him on your boat? Yes, yes. He was, Mel Fisher was dead broke. He didn't have any help. His mother, who was senile and had dementia, was sitting as, at, the, at the desk. And every day I'd have to tell her who I was to, to go in and talk to Mel. And, uh, and then I, I had an office with uh, Duncan Matheson and... Uh, uh, what's the name that did that found the uh found the Atosha? Uh, the archae archaeologist, uh, not the archaeologist, the researcher, Cor Cor no, uh, geez, just skip me anyway. So I had, I had an office there at Mount Fisher's, and we had our, our boat there, we had a sailboat, so we all lived on that. I had the big boat out on the site for about uh, how long were we out there? Twenty nine months. Um, I, I was out there. I think ninety days myself. So yeah. I, something like that. We were out there a long time. Well, that's all I had. Yes. My question is about um, Cuba and Garden of the Queens. So uh, Fidel was an avid spear fisherman. He loved the water. Did he? Was he, did he talk to you at all about that sanctuary concept when you were diving with him? No, and, and that didn't exist then. This was back in 1983 okay. that we were diving, a long time ago. And, uh, but he did, we went to uh, uh, Isla de Piedras, which is a little tiny enclave that he had. He had a little like a, a hotel six, motel six there with about 12 rooms. And he kept his fishing boats there. And, they had some dolphins and uh, every night we had dinner, as I said, from six to two in the morning and asking him questions. And then uh, about two years later, I organized for the World Business Council. That's the Young Presidents uh, Association. When they get to be over 40, they have to have their own club. And we took a, a trip and I lined up the trip to Cuba. And there we had an, uh, a lecture in, in their parliament, uh, it was the the master ceremonies was not Fidel, it was the head of the World Business Council. And so he asked all the questions and, and that's where and that picture that you saw of him wearing the MRDF t-shirt, I have a picture in my office with an autograph on it. I got it the next time back there when we, when we met with him. So I've been to Cuba about four times. Uh, it's It's a great place with potential archeological that, that they can't develop. Is, is the guy trying to think of Gene Lyons? Yes, it is. Thank you. Thank you. That's right. Any other questions? Yes, I have a couple from Zoom. This one is from Dan Orr, who was one of our previous emergency cell speakers. We talked about great white sharks. And he asks, are you still hunting treasure today? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> or are you hunting submerged cultural resources. resources. As a matter of fact, we haven't done any treasure hunting for about 40 years, and we really have done serious archaeology. And the answer is, but I'm working with some really interesting folks around the world on big archaeological projects. Was anything in the amphoras still edible? And if so, did you try some? No. <laughs> the answer is no, they were empty, and no, we didn't try them. Another question from Zoom is, what is the name of your book and what is the video about Roman ships? I'd like to watch it. The video about Roman ships, if you, you can go on Google mm -hmm. and it's called Lost Ships of Rome. And uh, it'll show Aurora Trust and, and it's a 54 minute movie. And it's really, they did a good job. It, it's pretty interesting. And the other question was- Your book. What is the name of your book? Oh, it's, I, I got it here. I brought it to it's called the Koblik Chronicles. And and uh, the reason they published it is because that I was the only person, living or dead, that was involved in these projects from the day before, you know, before they ever started until they were done and wrapped up. 
Tech Type 1, it was my research station that I was building where we had Tech Type 1. Tech Type 2, I went, as it says in the book there, and got the funding for Tech Type 2. I was a program manager. I was an aquanaut. Uh, the, a lot, I, I ran the science program. There are a whole bunch of things I did. And then uh, after that, I built La Chalupa and ran the Puerto Rico International Undersea Operation in Puerto Rico, and then brought it here. And I've had Jules Undersea Lodge operating here since 1986. And we had Marine Lab, a little habitat built by the Naval Academy here in Key Largo for 18 years. I just brought it out and turned it into a museum at, at Marine Resources. Talk about your transition between aquanaut and your relationship with the astronauts? Tech Type 1 was a NASA program to look at long-term compatibility of crews in space. It was, it was a, a, a analogy for the 60-day space station program that they put up, Space Lab, I think it was called. And so that started out, that's where I met Scott Carpenter. We became fast friends. We traveled for 30 years around the world. And uh, we did the Scott Carpenter Man in the Sea program down here. I'm in a diving club called Sea Space Symposium, which is made up of people in the ocean, people in space, and government folks. So we have or have uh, Kathy Sullivan is a member, Sylvia Earle's a member in the in the diving part and in the space in the space part. Well, Kathy's a space space lady too, but we have like 14 astronauts. Scott Carpenter was, Buzz Aldrin is. Uh, he's getting a little too old to dive now, but, but up to the last year and a half, he's been diving. Uh, and so we meet twice a year. And, and that's been one of the connections. I'm also on the Astronaut Hall of Fame Selection Committee uh, for picking the astronauts that go into the Hall of Fame. And we've run here in Key Largo, I ran a 30-day NASA mission uh, again, studying human behavior under uh, under pressure and, and isolated. Um, so it's just been a long program, many, many years of working with these different folks, and we're still working with them. So I have a question about the Roman shipwrecks. It seemed, it seemed like there were a lot of them. And we understand in here in the Keys why well, there were a lot of shipwrecks out in our shallow reefs with a bad storm. What was it that caused the Roman shipwrecks to do sh storms come up unexpectedly and quickly? Were the shipwrecks overloaded? What's the thinking behind why many of them say? The, the ships themselves failed either because of rough seas or a plank breaking loose or a shifting of the cargo. Uh, in, a, in a big sea, because if, if you've ever looked at the amphora, they start up like this, they come down and they're shaped to a point. And that was because then they would stack next to each other and hold each other. But once the ship started rocking around really bad, the whole ship would go and, and the entire cargo would go over with it. And if you look, most of those wrecks showed the cargoes were laying down. Flat. Uh, so they were, they were sailors caught in a in a bad situation. They, none of them were battles and none of them ran up on a reef. They were all in deep water. And that's why they're so pristine. Did you find any skeletal number? No. <laughs> no. no. We, uh, we tried to go into the submarine, but uh, the British Navy didn't want anybody doing that. I had actually lined up a, a very small ROV to go in there and look around. That hasn't been done yet. No. Any other questions? So, Jan, we would like to thank you for, um, I would like to thank you for helping us immensely and giving us a lot of guidance with our Aquanauts to Astronauts exhibit um, that was really helpful and connecting us with different astronauts to get some artifacts and to get Michael here for the grand opening. So thank you very much.
for that. Um, as a speaker, we have a thank you gift. It actually renews your membership so that you can come to the museum in your spare time when you're not out traveling the world, 362 or 363 if it's a leap year, um, days that we're open, we are closed three days. And um, anyway, to thank you very much for everything that you do for us. I was pretty happy with the barrel. <laughs> So thank everybody for being here. Thank you for um, those of you that were on Zoom. We are going to record this and upload it to the History of Diving Museum YouTube channel for those of you that will um, be able to review it again. Again, we thank our sponsor tonight, retired Admiral Kurt Tidd, who is a member of the museum and uh, a supporter. We encourage you all to come and see you uh, next month.